When you hear the word worship, what do you think of? Church buildings? Sunday morning gatherings? Singing and praise? You can worship God every day of the week as you live out your faith. You worship God as you develop habits of forgiveness, prayer, Bible study, generosity, and so much more. Growing up, I have very vivid memories on Sunday mornings before my family would go to church. And I'd see my dad go usually into the laundry room where he kept his briefcase, and he'd pull out his checkbook, and he would write a check for church. And he would do this Sunday after Sunday. And I remember when I got about to be nine or 10, I snuck in when he wasn't looking and looked at the check and looked at the amount. And to a nine-year-old kid, like any amount is huge. And I remember asking my dad, Dad, this is a lot of money. Why, why do you give that much money to church? Kind of thinking, why don't you give that to me? And I'll never forget what my dad said. And he said it with all sincerity. He said, son, we've been given so much by God. It's a privilege to give. And I'm so glad that he said that to me when I was nine or 10, because that's exactly how God feels about us and giving. That, um, you know, so often we think of an offering is something I have to do. Then we feel guilty if we don't. And that's just the complete opposite of what God intends for us. That I love when the Bible talks about giving, talks about God wanting us to have a cheerful heart because he had a cheerful heart giving to us. And that, that's shown ultimately in Jesus being the ultimate offering for us on the cross. What better example and what better evidence that God gave his all to us. And now giving is a privilege. Regardless of how much material things you have, God has given me, he's given you the most spiritual blessings, the best spiritual blessings we could ask for. And if we're really honest, we look at the material things and he's given us a lot there as well. And so what I really try and focus on when it comes to giving and offering, especially of money, is to start with a cheerful heart because all that God has given to me. And if I have any guilt, any feelings of have to, I just lay that at the feet of Jesus and say, God, make my heart cheerful. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Hey everyone, it's so great to have you with us today as we conclude our message series, not just on Sunday. And today the theme is with a gift in my hand. Today as we start this message, I thought it would be good for us to just be able to evaluate our view of money. And what I want you to do is to just take a look at these images that we're going to bring up on the screen. And I want you to just think about what your gut reaction is when you see them. Let's bring up the first one. This is a common sight here in the valley, isn't it? Just about every street corner at this time of the year, especially. What do you think about when you see this individual? Or maybe when you go shopping with your friends up in Scottsdale and go to the Scottsdale Mall or maybe to the Biltmore and you see this individual, what do you think? What do you see? Or maybe if you see this car driving next to you, what do you think about when you see this kind of car? Or maybe as you're driving down the street and you look at this image and, and you see these kinds of homes, uh, in the very nice neighborhoods around here, what is it that's going through your mind? You see, what we did was just a little test. You see, each of us has a little courtroom inside of us that we tend to judge what we see. We judge what people wear, we judge people where they live, we judge people on how they drive, and so on. 
And we need to understand that that judgment is based on what we value. So for example, if we value people over money, then guess what? That is going to lead us to a very different conclusion than maybe those who value money over people and they're willing to do whatever they can to get more. Well, today, we have a very important question that we're going to be considering as we conclude this message series. And the question is this, how does my view of money affect my view of God and others? Now, in order to answer that question, we're actually going to dive into the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10 and understand that, that Luke wasn't necessarily an eyewitness, but he was an interviewer. He was the, the newspaper writer of the day who interviewed all the eyewitnesses of Jesus' life. And I'm guessing that one of the people that he interviewed was the subject of this particular first part of this chapter, and that's a man by the name of Zacchaeus. And so this is where we're going to start, starting with verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, what we don't know based on just the, the first couple of verses here is what Jesus was doing as he was going through Jericho. He was actually at this point on his way to Jerusalem. Not many days after this, he was going to be making his entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey on a day that we call Palm Sunday. And just five days after that was the day we call Good Friday in which Jesus gave his life on the cross. And so this all transpired only a matter of maybe a couple of weeks before Jesus gave his life on the cross. And so here we find that there was this man by the name of Zacchaeus. Now Zacchaeus, because he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy, well, in, in our culture, if we lived at that time, you want to know what kind of list he would be on? He would be on a offender list, not necessarily a sex offender list, but an offender list that was very similar to the way that our society treats sex offenders, pedophiles, human traffickers, you name it. He would be the kind of person that would be lumped into that same category. That's how the people of his day viewed him. Matthew called him a chief tax collector and said that he was wealthy. If you interviewed and asked the other people of the city of Jericho what kind of terms would come to mind if they thought of Zacchaeus, two words, traitor and cheater. Because he was a tax collector, he actually worked for the Roman government, even though he was most likely of Jewish descent. And that labeled him as a traitor, that he was working for a government that basically honored pagan gods. And so to many of the Jews, this was actually a first commandment issue. And not only that, but they also labeled him a cheater. Because in those days, the Roman government, as long as they got their quota of taxes, they didn't care what the tax collectors did. Fraud wasn't a concern to them. And so many of the tax collectors took advantage of the system and they charged more than the actual taxes were. And so then they became extremely wealthy. And the fact that Matthew here tells us that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was wealthy tells us that he had worked the game really well, that he knew how to get ahead. And often it was at the advantage of taking on other people's money in the process. And money was his God. And he was willing to sacrifice his energy, his time, his integrity, his relationships with his family and his friends, he was willing to sacrifice all of that in order to gain more. But here's the thing, as we think about this question of how does my view of money affect my view of God and others, this is what Zacchaeus had found out. Money is given by God to serve people. But when people love and serve money, it becomes a horrible master. And that's just so true, isn't it? I mean, you think about it that many of us have, have fallen into this lie at times. And the delusion is that we believe that if we have more money, then that's going to get rid of all of our problems. 
And let's be honest, there are some problems that having more money will get rid of. In fact, a Pastor Mike Novotny in his book, What's Big? Starts Small. By the way, it's a great read. And this is what he has to say in his chapter on wealth and the deceitfulness of wealth. This is, these are some of the headlines in that chapter. He says, more money equals more experiences. So in other words, I can do things because I have more money versus those who maybe don't have as much. I can do more. I can have more experiences. More money equals more comfort. Ain't that the truth? The last time I checked, the bed that you sleep on and the bed that I sleep on are much nicer than the park bench that the homeless person sleeps on. More money does equal more comfort. More money also equals more respect. It's interesting that this last week as I flew back to Wisconsin for a wedding, in order to be able to fit my suit, I had to wear it. And you know what? I have a pretty nice suit. And the thing is, is that it's just interesting how people treat you a little bit differently when you're wearing a suit compared to when you're just wearing your everyday casual jeans. More money equals more respect. More money also equals more security. I can lock my home. I have a home because I have money. And isn't that true as well? More money equals more opportunity. <laughs> that is so true as well that for those of us who have money, we're able to take those opportunities to go on vacations, to be able to go see some of the things that we otherwise wouldn't be able to see. There's more opportunity. More money equals more rest. That yeah, you know what? You can go to that beach and enjoy that condo and enjoy that rest because you have the money that God has given you. And finally, more money equals more impact. Just think about all of the amazing charities that we have around us and why? Because there's generous people who desire to make an impact because they have more money. They can do more with it, have more impact with it. Well, sign me up, right? I mean, that, that's the, that money is designed to be a blessing for us. But how often, like Zacchaeus, don't we find that that blessing can turn to stressing when we want more? Isn't that true? Because here's what Zacchaeus found. Zacchaeus found that more money doesn't make you more happy. That more money doesn't make you more fulfilled. In fact, Zacchaeus found out that living the dream can become a nightmare when it is a relentless pursuit of more. And that's what led Zacchaeus to Jesus that day. Zacchaeus was looking for the more that he knew money could not buy. He was looking for happiness and fulfillment. He was looking for peace and hope. And he found it in Jesus. What's interesting is that we're not really told how Zacchaeus had heard about Jesus. But what we do know is that Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus. And, and what's interesting is that when you look back to Luke chapter 18, so the chapter right before this one, you see that we actually have Luke recording for us that Jesus told the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And that in that parable, Jesus had actually held out hope for tax collectors who humbled themselves and repented of their sins. And so Zacchaeus was like, I've got to hear this rabbi that says that he's willing to hold out hope for us hopeless tax collectors. I've got to meet this guy. I've got to meet this guy and see if he'd be willing to hang out with me. And so here we go. If you look at verse 3 then of Luke chapter 19, what happened? It says, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner? So don't you think it's interesting that when Jesus got to that spot, he looked up and he looked right at Zacchaeus and said, I must come to your house today. It, Jesus could have said to Zacchaeus, you know what, Zacchaeus? You need to change your ways. You need to repent. Now go home and give back all that you have taken from other people. But he didn't. Instead, what Jesus did was he took 
the time to go and hang out with somebody that no one else wanted to hang out with. And, and this is the key in understanding how the view of money affects our view of God and others. Maybe some of us are actually in a denial about the love of money. Maybe, maybe some of us are like, nah, I don't have a problem with that. I, I wish I had more, but what's the harm with wanting more? Well, that's where it, be, it begins, right? That, that pursuit of more is what sometimes makes the pursuit our God. And sometimes we, we do. We just we look around and we're like, boy, I wish I had what that person had. I, I wish I had the new Escalade. I, I wish I had the, the Prada brushed leather boots. I mean, we're entering into boot season, right, ladies? It's only 1500 bucks a pair. I, I wish that I had that new Lamborghini that just pulled right up next to me and while well, you know, I'm, I'm revving the engine of my Toyota Camry or whatever, right? I wish for more. And, and that's the thing, that that's where it begins. And Zacchaeus will tell you that you can have more and more and more. You can be like the wealthiest person. You can live in that $20 million building on the top of the mountain in Paradise Valley, and you're still going to be wanting more. And Zacchaeus struggled with that. He struggled with the, the idea that, you know what, enough is never enough. And, and this is what Jesus wants to teach us today, that money isn't the problem. The love of money is the problem. Because that's where Zacchaeus became trapped. And that's where Zacchaeus was willing to give up his integrity, to give up his relationships, to give up his family, to give up the birthdays with his nieces and nephews, to, to give up all of that so that he could have more. The love of money is the problem. And Jesus is the solution. You see, what Jesus showed Zacchaeus and what he shows you and me is the fact that he's willing to hang out with us. He's willing to give up his time to spend with us. He's willing to be the one who would go and be the guest of a sinner as the people were accusing him of. Because Jesus loves people. Jesus loves money-hungry, money-hoarding people who have worked their way up the corporate ladder and sacrificed integrity and sacrificed relationships and sacrificed people along the way. Jesus loves those people too, like Zacchaeus. And maybe he loves people like you and me who secretly want more and are wishing for more. And Jesus loves those people who are at the top and who are just tired Restless, because they have continued to pursue more. And what Jesus tells us is he's the solution to all of that, because he is enough. And how did Zacchaeus know that Jesus loved him? Again, it was because Jesus was willing to go and hang out with him. And more than that, just maybe a week and a half or maybe a couple weeks after Jesus hung out with Zacchaeus, Jesus hung on a wooden cross to pay the price for Zacchaeus' greed and yours and mine. And he paid the price with his life. It's interesting that years later, the Apostle Paul wrote to his fellow Christians in Corinth and encouraging them to be generous like Jesus was generous to us. And this is what he had to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace, in other words, that undeserved love of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Well, let me ask you, how did Jesus exactly become poor. I mean, he is the owner of everything, right? He's the Lord. How did, how did he become poor? Well, understand that when Jesus paid the price for our sins, he took on the debt of the world. Every sin of every sinner. And if you think our national debt is something to behold, like what is it, $30 trillion or whatever, just think about every sin of every sinner who has ever or will ever live. That's what Jesus paid for. 
And that's how much he loves you and he loves me. And so what kind of impact did that have on Zacchaeus? And what kind of impact can that kind of love have on you and me in our view of money? Take a look at verses 8 and 9. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now, just stop there for a moment. Don't miss the significance of what Zacchaeus called Jesus. He called him Lord. Did you realize that another word for Lord is master? You see, Zacchaeus was willing to say, hey, Jesus, you're my master now. Because of your love for me, you have changed my view of money. Because of what you're willing to do for me, I'm now willing to give half of what I have to the poor. And notice that Jesus doesn't judge Zacchaeus for not giving the other half. Not at all. And that's the beauty of it, that Jesus' love for Zacchaeus actually freed him from his love of money so that now he could love people and use the money. And I think that's just such a significant point. And, and so this is the next point that we have, that Jesus' love changed him from loving money and using people to loving people and using money. Zacchaeus no longer worshipped money. He worshipped Jesus. Jesus was his master. And so now he was free to love people and use his money to bless them. He was, he was willing to give half of his possessions back to the poor. And then notice that he says, I'm going to pay back four times the amount. Do you realize that the Jewish law said that if you cheated somebody, that you, would, you were only required to pay back twice the amount. But what Zacchaeus actually does is he doubles the double. And why is that? Because Jesus' love changed him from loving money and using people to loving people and using money. He had changed his heart. Jesus' generosity and Jesus' love for him had changed his heart. Now, I know what you're thinking right about now. This, this is the point in the message maybe where the pastor is going to say, okay, so because Jesus is generous for you, now I want you to give to the church. No. I'm not going to tell you to give your money to the church because remember, it's not your money. And it's not my money. Everything that we have is actually on loan to us from our gracious God. God is the one who blesses us with what we have. He's the one that blesses us with all of our income. Everything that's in your bank account is his. So I'm not going to tell you to give your money back to him because God already has it. He doesn't need your money. But the beautiful thing is, is that he wants us to use money to love other people. That's why he gives it to us. It's interesting that uh, just recently I heard a story of a man who took his daughter to McDonald's and uh, he ordered a Happy Meal for her and as they sat down to eat the meal, he kind of reached across the table and he grabbed a fry from her, her stash there and she slaps his hand. And she's like, that's mine. <laughs> to which just with a smile, he said, really, honey, is that really yours? And it was one of those teachable moments, right? And, and there are times where we're just like that little daughter, aren't we? That, hey, God, it's mine. I, I don't want to give it back to you. Or, hey, God, it's, it's mine. I don't want to be able to give to those people who are maybe less fortunate than me. And all the while, just like that father with his daughter, our God teaches us love. That he gives us the money that we have to love people and use it to love people. And by the way, one of the ways that we can do that is to give our offerings to the Lord, to give our first fruit offerings to the Lord, to give back to him because he has been so giving and generous to us. And in fact, that actually fulfills part of Jesus' mission. I mean, this is what he says in verses 9 and 10 of Luke 19. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. 
For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. When we give back a portion of our income to our God, and I'm not going to tell you the amount, but when we give back a portion of it in our offerings, do you realize what God does with it? He brings salvation to people. He seeks and saves those who are lost. He changes people's eternal destinies by making them, as he says here, a son of Abraham, which just simply means that it's a son of the, the faith that Abraham had in God. That's what we get to be a part of. Because here's Jesus' bottom line, and here's our, our final point. Jesus' bottom line isn't to fill the church's bank. Jesus' bottom line is to fill heaven. That's the why behind the W of our crosswalk values. Our, the W of our crosswalk values, of, of the acronym of crosswalk, the W, stands for that we're willing to share our wealth generously. It's not a got to. It's a get to. It's because Jesus invites us into his mission to seek and to save and to love those who are lost. That we get to leverage the resources that God gives us to make a difference for someone now and for eternity. And that's not just through the offerings that we give. It's through maybe an act of kindness to that homeless person on the corner. Maybe it's going to the St. Mary's Food Bank or going to the food banks that we have in our local schools and donating there. Maybe it is through our next door neighbor and offering to cook meals for them and bring them over to them as they're going through a hard time. However we get to do it, let's be willing to share our wealth generously because Jesus was so willing to share his love and his forgiveness and his mission with you and me. And it's understanding that it's not about that feel-good moment, even though it does feel good sometimes to give to those who are less fortunate than us. It's not about the feel-good moment. It's about God taking that moment and making it a life-changing, heaven-destining moment. So let's be a part of Jesus' mission to fill heaven because it's not just on Sunday. It's every day that with a gift in our hands, we get to make a difference in someone else's life. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for the fact that you were so willing to leave the glories and the riches of heaven to take on the impossible debt that we would never be able to pay. It would take an eternity to pay, and even then we would still owe it. And that is the debt of our greed and every sin that we're guilty of. Thank you for paying that debt, Lord. Thank you for willingly going to the cross and enduring the agony of the cross so that we can be forgiven and that we are heirs of eternal life and that now we are a part of your mission to seek and to save those who are lost, that you give us the opportunities to use the resources that we have so that we can willingly share our wealth generously. And so bless each of us, Lord, as we seek to be a blessing with others, not just on Sunday. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.